speaker for today. Our speaker is Tara Huska, who is currently the Good Health and Wellness Tobacco Health Educator here at the Great Plains Tribal Charity Health Board. Tara collaborates with multiple tribes, state, and national partners to help develop, disseminate, and improve policy system and environmental approaches to tobacco cessation. Tara has an extensive background in environmental science with 10 years of plant identification throughout South Dakota, and she received her bachelor's degree from Haskell University. So Tara, if you want to go ahead and start sharing your screen. And I'd like to remind people to please mute your, um, please mute your screen so we don't hear background noise. Can you guys see the screen okay? Okay. All right, today I'm gonna to be talking about traditional plants uh, used by the Lakota and Dakota people of the Great Plains. Um, I'm focusing mostly on the Lakota and Dakota uses because I am Lakota. Um, I don't really have the experience working with plants from other tribes. A little bit about me, um, I do have a bachelor's in environmental science with an emphasis in biology from Haskell Indian Nations University, like Marie said. I have 10 years of experience collecting and identifying plants. Most of the um, has been here in the Black Hills in the both of the South Dakota and the Wyoming side of the Black Hills. I also worked on a medicinal plant project with the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in their cultural preservation program. I am not a medical doctor or a medicine woman and everything published or everything in this presentation is already public and published information. So because I am a tobacco health educator, I did start out with the red willow, which is also called the red Aussie dogwood. It is um, called Shinshasha in Lakota. You can usually find it in wetland bottoms near water. A lot of the other plants that you can find it that we use that have medicinal purposes are some of the mints, the sweet flag and arrowroot, which you'll see in my presentation later. And as you can see from the picture, it has a small white flower and the fl it flowers in clusters. The stems are red. In the wintertime, they become a brighter red and they have opposite and simple leaves. So opposite means they are directly opposite from each other on the stem. The basic uses um, it's the basic ingredient for. Uh, traditional tobacco, it's commonly mixed with bearberry, lovage root, and osha root. Uh, Lakota people only gather this after the last thunder and before the first thunder of the spring. So this is during the winter months when the plant is dormant, so when they collect it, it doesn't kill the actual plant. Uh, one of the other cool facts that I found on it is the Chinese have found um, it is used to be or it's, they use it to treat diabetes. Sweetgrass, um, the Lakota name is, and I'm sorry if I'm butchering this, uh, Peji Wanonga. It grows in wet meadows, low prairies, in the edges of sloughs and marshes. You can find it near mints, milkweeds, red willow, and arrowroot. The sweet grass that we have here in the Black Hills area is a lot different than what it is in Canada. In Canada, it grows in larger groups together and it grows a lot taller and that's how they're able to make the long um, braids. When you find it in this area, it's shorter and it doesn't grow in big clumps like it does in Canada. Many people use sweet grass differently, but is commonly used for smudging. Some believe that it should be used to keep bad spirits away and some use it for cleansing. Many people also keep braids with them as protection. 
Infusions were also made to treat different health reasons as well as treating sick dogs. It's best to collect after the seeds fall and cut near the ground when it's at its tallest and don't pull for the roots. And you'll see this with a lot of plants. You want to cut at the bottom of the plant and don't pull from the roots unless you're collecting the root of the plant. It, because if you do this, it won't grow back in the same spot again. It's very sweet smelling. I'm sure many of you guys have smelt it. Bearberry and Kniknik. And this is Wak Pei, Chan Li. Um, this one is found really commonly in the Black Hills along the forest floor. It's really small and it's kind of what they call a creeping plant. It's basic uses. It's smoked and usually mixed with other herbs. Infusions from the leaves, stem, berries are used for pain. Root of the bearberry can also be consumed in the form of a tea and used in treatment of cough or excessive menstrual bleeding. Tea made of the bark is used to accelerate recovery after childbirth. And there's also a tea made of dry leaves collected during the autumn. And it's used for treatment of infections of the urinary tract, like kidney or bladder disorders. Rocky Mountain Juniper. This is a Honte. It's found below 7,500 feet in elevation. It is tolerant um, of drought and it's actually found in most places in the Black Hills. I've seen it more on the western side of the Black Hills at certain elevations, but then I've also seen it in the prairie along the pine bluffs. It's a small evergreen and it's um, burned and used in smudging. It's also said to keep bad spirits away. The boughs, branches, and cones were made into an infusion to treat colds, pneumonia. An infusion of the leaves are also used to treat cholera. Many people prefer to use the flat cedar for burning, but they both have the same use, but um, the flat cedar has a sweeter smell, and the flat cedar is harder to find in this area. I don't think it's native to the Black Hills in South Dakota area. Arrowroot, um, I'm not even going to attempt to say those names, but you can see it has owl moccasin and small bead stem. It's kind of interesting looking at the different names that the plants have, kind of wondering how they came up with them. But this one is found in really wet soils, uh, usually marshes, swamps, forested seeps, ditches lakes, ponds, usually, I've seen this one growing directly straight from the water. When I actually took this photograph, I had collected it because I was going to press it. So this picture of it isn't in the water. I was holding it up with the water in the background. Its roots are eaten and used as a medicine. This one is kind of hard to find a lot of information on, but from what I've been told from Others, it has a lot of medicinal use. Sweet flag, or sometimes called bitter root. It's found in wet soil, shallow water, in ditches, marshes, river edges, and ponds. I actually have not found this plant species in South Dakota. I think it's more commonly found in the prairies. But while I was going to school in Kansas, we found it commonly and actually grew it in our medicinal garden on campus. It's chewed up to help with toothaches, sore throats, and colds, and can be made into a cough syrup. Singers use it when their th throats are dry, and it's also used in sweats. When it's put on the hot rocks, it's used like a decongestant. The dried roots are used to treat heartburn or gas. And it can also be made into a detoxion that um, breaks a fever. And the root and stalks are edible. 
lead plant. This is one of my favorite plants and the reason why it's my, one of my favorite plants is because it's an indicator species and an indicator species means that if you see it in an area, you know that the land is pristine, it's in good condition, it's not overgrazed, and it's a really pretty plant. It is found in dry black soil prairies, sand prairies, gravel prairies, hill prairies. I think it's found pretty much in all the prairies in South Dakota. It's also found in the Black Hills and grassy areas. Other plants you can find near it is Echinacea, which is the purple coneflower, which is in my presentation also. Its basic uses are it makes a tasty tea with no known medicinal purposes, but mixing dry leaves with fat can be used in smoking mixtures, and a rubbing paste from the root was also used to attract buffalo. And like I said, it was it's my favorite because it's an um, indicator species, which is why I think it's a cool plant. Horse mint, this is also one of my favorite plants. It's Heihaka. Tape juta, which is an elk medicine. It's found in upland woods, thickets, and prairies. I've actually seen it all over South Dakota in the prairie, in the hills. Right now, uh, the purple parts are almost com not completely gone, but um, in the hills, they're still up there. In the prairie, I'm not sure how much is left of them, but this is a really good time of year to collect the leaves from these plants. The leaves are chewed and put under bandage to stop the flow of blood. The tea made from leaves strained and put on a soft cloth and placed on sore eyes overnight. So it'll probably help with bags under eyes also. The tea from the leaves is effective against whooping cough and other coughing. And it's good for people who faint. The fragrant leaves are also chewed while people are singing and dancing. And women would use the leaves as perfume and it's said to have seductive powers in attracting the opposite sex and favored by the elkman. Chewed leaves are also applied to wounds to stop, which I already said that, and it's um, also used to treat heartburn and gas. Field mint, chayaka, um, is used in a lot, mostly teas, it is found along shoreline, stream banks, and in wet meadows, prairies, ditches, we actually have some here behind our office that I had found during one of our walks. It makes a really good tea in its leaves and roots were mixed. It makes a stronger tea tree to treat toothaches. Um, during collection, I would pick after the seeds have fallen and not to pull up from the roots to cut near the ground. Bear root. This is a highly medicinal plant that I've been told a lot of medicine men use them, but it, you cannot found, find this plant in South Dakota at all. It's only found in the Rocky Mountains from elevations of 7,000 to 10,000 feet. It has parsley-like leaves in white flowers. It can be brewed as a remedy for relieving respiratory disorders and fevers and is also mixed with other medicines and used as a tonic tea or smoked. The dry roots can also be used to smudge sweat lodges. Yucca, I'm sure most of you guys have seen this plant all over South Dakota. It grows in mesic to dry black soil prairies, sand prairies, gravel prairies, and hill prairies. You can find it near the lead plant and the echinacea. The pulverized roots are mixed with tepid water that makes a tea that is used for belly aches. The roots can also be used in the making of soap. Soaking hair in a root solution is a vermin killer and it's also said to make the hair grow. Fumes from burning the roots are also used when attempting to catch or halter a horse. And the leaves are also used to start as fire. And part of the root was used in a mix when tanning hides. And one of the cool things about this plant that I think is cool is it used to be part of the lily family. And the reason why they classified that is because of the petals on the flower. Smooth sumac. 
Um, many of you have probably seen this. It's actually a pretty common plant for landscaping. The Lakota name is Chanzi. It is drought resistant and commonly found in open fields and roadsides, fence rows, railroads, right of ways and burned areas on sandy or gravel soil. I've actually seen it all over every, on the sides of almost every dirt road in South Dakota, in the hills and on the prairie. Oops. Sorry. Its leaves are smoked when they turn red in the fall. The berries were used in a tea and an infusion from the roots were also used to treat colds. Showy milkweed, this is another one of my favorites and you can actually see this one on this plant right now. I think the seed pods are getting ready to come up and most of the flowers are gone, but it's considered to be, or you can find it, let me see, in well-drained soil in full or nearly full sun, pastures, meadows, forest clearing, roads, ditch banks, all over the place. It's a women's medicine. The blossoms boiled and mixed with flour make a good dish. Floral bud clusters were used to thicken up soups. And I know some tribes use this in soups quite often. Open flowers cut up for a sort of preserve. The plant tops were also strained and used as an eye medicine. And it, was to it was found to have strong cytotoxicity to breast cancer cell lines. And when the entire plant is dried, it is used in a tea to help mothers who are not producing milk. Green milkweed, which is closely related to the showy milkweed, but it's not found as commonly as the other one. This one you'll find mostly in the prairies. Um, it occurs in high quality habitats rather than degraded areas. So if you're seeing an area that's highly grazed by cattle or horses, you won't see it as much. The pulverized roots given, are given to children with diarrhea and when the entire plant is dried, it's also used to help mothers who are not producing milk. So it has a lot of same medicinal properties as the showy milkweed. Sage. This sage can be found quite commonly across South Dakota in the hills and in the prairie. It is used as crowns and bracelets for sun dances. It's used in sweat lodge and used to smudge. It's considered to be one of the most powerful sages. There are, I think, around a hundred or around a hundred different species of sages. There's sage bushes and there's smaller sage species like this one. The leaves from the sage are also used in a tea to treat headaches, colds, and sore throats. And it was also used to treat diarrhea. And this plant, one time when I was out hiking in the woods at work, I had a headache and I knew it was used to treat headaches. So I pulled some of the leaves on, chewed on them for a while and my headache went away. So I think it really, it really does work. And when you collect it, you wanna collect it when it doesn't have the seeds on it. Purple cone, cone flower, or some people refer to as black Samson. It, it is found in open rocky prairies and plains. The root and green fruit are used, are chewed as a medicine for toothache, tonsillitis, belly aches, or when one is thirsty or over perspiring. The chewed root is applied to swelling, snake bites, and burns. And it's also used to treat enlarged glands like mumps. And when it's burnt, it's used to distemper horses. One of the cool facts, or kind of cool facts, is it's Pharmaceutical companies use it a lot in immune system builders like the Airborne and I know you can buy it as a supplement by itself as well. I know when I feel a cold coming on, I take an Echinacea supplement to help build up my immune system. Breadroot or prairie turnip. This is what we call, Lakota people call Timsila. 
It grows best in full sun on well-drained and rocky or sandy soil. The plant is most commonly found on undisturbed prairie. The plant, if you look at it, there's a lot of plants in this family that look very similar to it in how I was taught to fit, tell the difference in the, what we call like the pea family is this one has a hairy stem and you can kind of see in the picture that the, you can, the hairs are really long on them. So it, it's a lot easier to identify and there's some hairs on the flowers, the little leaves by the flowers. Timsila is a major food source for the Lakota and Dakota tribes. And it's dried and put in soups and used in a form of wasna. And you can see in the bottom of the picture, I included a photo of a braid of Timsila. So you can see what it looks like when we collect it and then what it looks like out in nature. Uh, you're supposed to collect Timsila in the month of June when the seed pods of the Timsila are mature. mature. Only dig up after the seeds fall, and after you dig it up, you put the entire plant in the hole where you dug it up from and bury it again so it'll come back in other years. Lavender hyssop. This is a very cool plant. It makes a very good tea. Its leaves were also rubbed onto the body to cool down when somebody has a fever and it's used to treat coughs and chest pain and also used in the tobacco mix. It's found in dry thickets, fields, in waste ground on prairies and plains as well as in the woods. This plant I find commonly in like birch and aspen forest areas in the Black Hills. It's in the mint family and because it's in the mint family, all the mints have a square stem so it makes it easier to identify and it smells and tastes like black licorice. Wild roses. Uh, this grows in a variety of different habitats, including disturbed areas. It's found in moist, rocky soils in mixed coniferous forests, in upper montane forests, and subalpine forests. This plant I've actually seen grow just about anywhere in South Dakota. And the rose hips are edible and make a very good tea that are also a good source of vitamin C. I know when I'm out hiking and I see them, I often collect them and just chew on them while I'm hiking. This is probably my all time favorite plant in the Black Hills. It's really hard to find and it's only found in a few areas in the Black Hills and it's called the leopard lily and I think it's one of my favorites. It's kind of close to my heart because I lost a aunt to cancer and this is the plant that I collected for her when she first went into remission and she drank it as a tea. She went into remission after she drank it as a tea and I also pressed it and framed it for her. So this is one of my favorite plants. It is Fritillaria atroperia. It is um, used as a medicine to help swollen glands. So like the Lakota name, if you look at it, it's a medicine used to Dr. Gopher, which is describes what somebody's cheeks would look like comparing it to a gopher. Uh, the areas that I've found it, it's been in higher elevations in the Black Hills and it's usually on forest edges. Um, I've found it near Flag Mountain, um, near Peshla, north of Deerfield, and also in the Bear Lodge Mountains. And it's usually right on the edge of the tree line. So if you're out in the woods hiking and you see a big open meadow, on the edges of the tree line is where I find this. And it's really hard to find because the flower hangs kind of upside down. So when you're walking, it just looks like a brown plant. But when you pick it up and look at it, you can see the purple and the yellow spots, which is amazing to see. Um, it also, when it's pulverized, it's made into a salve and rubbed on scrofulous swellings and used to treat various cancers.
I've also included in this presentation some of the different food sources as traditional plants, and these are all found commonly throughout the Black Hills, the wild onions, ground plums, the wild plum and the ground plum, you can see the difference of them. The ground plums are in the, the I think it's the legume family. It's like the pea family and it grows close to the ground almost creepingly and it has these ground plums. You can find it in the hills and on the prairie as well. And the wild plum tree, it's an actual tree. It's, so it's not like a small plant and it's found usually near water. But both of those plums you can, I think are usually used, not eaten raw, but used boiled into soups. And then we also have the service berries, choke, choke cherries and wild raspberries. The service berries are harder to find than the choke cherries are. The choke cherries, especially this time of year, are really easy to find. But the service berries are found not as commonly as the service berries, and I think it's in higher elevations, but you can find them sometimes mixed in with the choke cherries. The service berries you can see on the picture, there's only a few berries on each end of the stem, and they actually taste almost identical to blueberries. They are amazing. Wild raspberries are also commonly found throughout the Black Hills. They're, sometimes they're harder to find because the fruits grow underneath the leaves. So sometimes when I'm looking and I see raspberry leaves, I kind of crouch down on the floor and you can look up under the leaves and you can see the clusters of berries. Right now, the choke cherry service berries and wild service berries and wild raspberries are all like ready to collect in most places. I think at the higher elevations, maybe not as much, but recently I was in Spearfish Canyon and the wild raspberries weren't quite ripe yet. One other thing I did want to mention while collecting plants, especially choke cherries, because it's something that our people collect commonly, is be careful where you collect it. A lot of these plants are found right next to the road and in most counties in South Dakota and all over the Great Plains, the counties spray for weeds. So some of these plants may have herbicides on them that are not healthy for you. So usually if I collect plants, it's far away from roadways because you also get the runoff um, from the chemicals that cars leave on the roadside. So that's one of my big things that I don't do and I would advise anybody else to not collect anything right along the road. And they also get really dusty if it's along a gravel road. My resources, these are the plants, or these are all the resources that I use commonly. Anytime I do anything with plants or look anything up, I own every single one of these books. And then I often use these websites. The USDA Plants Database is a really good resource for plants, especially if you know the, or the scientific name. It doesn't do a lot of good if you don't know the scientific name, but it's going to tell you the scientific information about each plant. The native plants at KU, that's also a good resource. Uh, two of the books that I have on here by Kelly Kindisher, he is a ethno by botanist from the University of Kansas. So he, they have an entire garden that's specific to medicinal plants. Uh, the Native American Medicinal Plant Book is a good one, but it doesn't really give you a lot of information about the plant. It just lists the plant and what it was used for and what tribe used for it. I do like it because it has all the tribes listed and what they were used for, but it doesn't give anything, spe anything more specific than that. The Plants of the Black Hills and Bear Lodge Mountains is a really good book if you want to go out or you want to identify plants when you're out in the woods or even in the prairie in um, South Dakota. Most of the prairie plants are in that one as well, but it has photographs of each plant. It has some use, like Lakota uses, some other tribes. It has the description, where to find it, in 
all the photographs in there are really well to where you can easily identify it from the photograph. And that's the same with the Grassland Plants Book of South Dakota. The Vascular Plants of South Dakota book is probably not a good book for somebody that's not familiar with botany terms. So this plant, this book right here is going to break down the plant for you. So it's going to start you in, you have to key it out. It's a key. So you're going to look at the leaves. You're going to, it's going to ask you what kind of stem, what the stem looks like, what color it is, the leaves, all that type of thing. And it's going to give you the exact plant identification. There's no photographs in that book. So if you're not familiar, familiar with botany, I wouldn't advise even opening that book. Um, this book in the right hand corner, it's the Lakota names and uses um, of the Sichangu people. This book was done by Dilwyn Rogers and it's based off the plant collection and identification that Father Bugel did back in the, I'm not even sure, 1800s sometime when he wrote the Lakota language. He also did a plant collection. So at St. Francis, they actually have the actual collection of plants that he collected. And that's where a lot of these names that I have come from. So these are most of the names that I have are directly from this book. Uh, one thing about the names, a lot of people ask me about plants and they're like, hey, do you know this plant? And the common names are different all over the board. You know, different towns, different families, all use different names, common names, and as, as well as Lakota names. So when people come to me with plants, it's really good to know the scientific name because it helps you identify the plant and see exactly, find more information, science information about the plant and compare it to other tribes uses. The scientific name also does change, but they don't use more than one at a time. So sometimes they update it um, and they switch families often. So that's what I use the USDA plants. They usually have the most current names for plants. These books are, have been around for a while. So some of them don't have the most common scientific names, but they're all really great books and I highly recommend them to you guys. And I think all these books, except for maybe the Native Hi, American Tara. medicinal plants and the vascular plants are found at Prairie Edge in Rapid City. Any questions? Well, thank you, Tara. That was a really informative presentation. Um, are there any questions from any of the participants today? If not, I would like to again encourage everybody on the call to um, to complete the evaluation. It's so essential to us getting feedback on how we could service the tribes and our different partners um, the best. So if you would help complete that, we'd really appreciate it. And our next month's meeting is, um, it is titled Promoting Healthy Lifestyles, Ancestral Eating, and the Indigenized Fitness Method. Um, that meeting will take place and we'll send out a meeting invite accord accordingly. It's going to be on September 13th at 1 o'clock p.m. So we will send a flyer with more in information as the date comes closer. If there are no further questions, I want to thank you in advance for completing our evaluation as well as wish everybody on the call a good day. Bye. Thank you.